We're going to be talking about deploying to Kubernetes thousands of times per day. Clearly, it's a popular topic. Uh, my name is Dan Garfield. I'm a full stack engineer, but I also run marketing at a company called CodeFresh. And I'm William Dennis, product manager on Google Kubernetes Engine. Uh, so we're going to be talking to you today about deploying thousands of times per day, and that's really all about high velocity. So uh, the first thing, you know, we're both engineers, but um, but the reason that we really want to talk about this today is because we work with a lot of really high velocity teams. From CodeFresh, I work with companies like UNICEF, Steelcase, Giphy, uh, if you like I, cat GIFs, you know. And I've worked with like eBay and Niantic. Yeah, so these are all teams that are doing high velocity deployment at scale. They're delivering containers into production every day. Um, and so we've been working with these teams and we've gleaned a number of lessons from them, the commonalities, I would say. That, uh, that we think are useful to the community. Now, some of these things that we talk about um, do highlight some Google Cloud stuff, some CodeFresh stuff, but really these are all things that you can take and use and, uh, and implement in your own processes regardless of where you're hosting it. Yeah, so why do people choose Kubernetes in the first place? Um, there, there are definitely a lot of reasons. One might be scalability, the ability to take an application and, and make it sort of planetary scale. Uh, avoiding downtime through the, the operator pattern, not, not, not getting that 3 a.m. wake-up call uh, and, and needing to add uh, or like reboot a server, reducing costs through bin packing, increasing developer velocity through releasing more frequently, and, of course, infrastructure abstraction not being tied into one particular cloud or one particular vendor. Um, so it was interesting to me when we had a technical advisory board a few months back, we had about 40 people in the room representing some uh, fairly big companies, and... We, we did a, just an informal poll of like what was like the most important feature, what is the most important reason that you picked Kubernetes, and to my surprise, actually about 80% of people put their hand up for developer velocity. So I think this is like a really important topic. It's an important point of like why people are actually choosing Kubernetes to begin with. Yeah, it's funny because we talk so much about scalability, so much about redundancy, but at the end of the day, what everybody really wants is they just want to be an effective engineering organization. They want to be able to have high velocity, be able to make changes very quickly, uh, and so it's not, uh, it does kind of stand out to me as a surprise, 80% of the people picked developer velocity as their reason for adopting Kubernetes. And by the way, this, these slides, these are things that you can take if you're trying to sell Kubernetes to your organization. We'll provide these, you can download them, take them, go use them like a club and beat your team and say, go, go get adopt Kubernetes, that's what we're gonna do. Um, there are kind of three big reasons why you want to adopt high velocity. Right, so like one, one important thing is reducing the risk. So we think that if you're releasing your software very frequently, even up to thousands of times per day, but as long as you're sort of releasing it at a, at a high cadence, um, the more atomic releases, you're not like batching everything up into like a massive kind of quarterly release. Mm -hmm. You're not sort of tying up various different things like maybe a new feature or a time-dependent feature with a security release. Uh, and it means that you, know, you can push these out, you can observe the effects, and if you have to roll back, you're only rolling back a little bit. You're not, kind of, you're not faced with that horrible situation where you, you, know, you had to deliver a feature by a particular date, and then there's a risk that you may have to roll it back because of some unrelated problem. Um, so we think like definitely reducing risk by deploying very frequently is, is a very important strategy. Yeah, uh, I think my dad used to say small cuts make small mistakes, right? So it's the same thing with, with software development. You reduce the risk. And with those big sort of giant commits, those quarterly releases, they're very cost inefficient. So high velocity is also about cost efficiency. So think about it this way. When you're making changes to code, the reason that you're making those changes is because those changes are going to give you business value, right? You're delivering something that's gonna make your company more successful, making more money. If those changes, any moment after those changes are complete and they're not delivered into production, you're basically paying money to store those. Uh, so your CFO is gonna love this point. Um, basically, you wanna get those things out faster because they're valuable for your company. And the third, which a lot of people don't think about, a lot of people think of high velocity, lots of changes, sounds like a security risk. Well, it's actually the opposite. Being high velocity means that you're gonna be more adaptable to change, and security isn't a game where like, hey, I did everything right, I don't have to worry about it anymore. No, security is a, is a game that changes all the time, right? SSL had a bug for 10 years, no one knew about. Heartbleed happened, internet blew up, everybody lost their minds. Um, if you're high velocity, and you walk in and there's a zero day, you're like, oh, I guess we have, to, we have one extra release to do today, no big deal. Uh, this is baked into our process, we do this every day, so it's not a problem for us. Um, so being high velocity actually also makes you more secure. So uh, save that one for all you financial industry folks, take that back uh, to the team. That's, that's a super valuable um, reason to adopt high velocity. So there are a lot of, uh, you know, 
how do you become high velocity? There's a lot of common or highly repeated <laughs> stuff that you'll hear. Uh, agile planning is super important. We're not going to beat the agile drum today. I think you guys have probably got it. Um, we're not going to beat the microservice architecture drum. You guys have probably heard a lot of that. Um, hopefully, everybody has drunk the Kool-Aid, maybe. But uh, and everybody, obviously, everybody knows that you could always use better testing. Um, we're going to talk about kind of five core lessons that we've learned from from working with all these different companies. So here is number one: high-velocity teams center on images. I can explain what this means. I have a, a quote here from uh, Daniel Stone. He says, our entire develop, test, stage, deploy cycle is Docker native. This reduces the complexity of each step, allowing us to build with a smaller team. So what does this mean? What does it mean to center on images? Well, if you think about an image, images are the star of the show in, in your release process, uh, in your development process. An image is immutable. Right? So it, when, it, when an image is created, it should be ready to launch. Uh, I talked to someone at a meetup recently, and um, we were talking about this point, and they said, you mean when I push my image to production, it shouldn't download a WAR file? No, don't do that. Oh my gosh. He said, well, it's pretty big. It's like 500 megs. And I was like, God, put it in your image. What are you talking about? Um, yeah, so your, your image should be ready to go, right? And by doing that, your image becomes a point of validation. Right? So previous to, to working with containers, you might validate a change set, but change sets are ephemeral. They don't have uh, dependencies associated with them. They don't have the underlying OS associated with them. They don't know anything about infrastructure. An image doesn't have that problem. You've baked everything in, uh, so you can move an image, and, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Now, um, having an image as the start of the show means that it's also connected to the entire process. So if you have a JIRA ticket, uh, or, uh, or you have test steps, all those things should be associated with an image, right? So you're going to, just like you have a, you know, maybe a commit or a feature branch associated with an image, you should have, a, a, sorry, an issue associated with a branch or a, or a commit. You should do the same thing with an image. Um, that includes like deployment status, status, and you should have a history, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Yeah, and another benefit of the images, uh, I was talking to a, a Japanese startup recently that were in the process of adopting Kubernetes, and they were most excited about this idea that you can take that same image that the developer built on their machine and, and take it all the way through to production, uh, through staging and tests. And it, it also means like if you actually encounter a bug in production, you can potentially pull that image down, connect that to your staging environment, and, and debug that way. And you have a lot more confidence that you're actually running the same exact uh, Dependencies and yeah. the same exact code. Yeah, reproducing bugs becomes super a, a lot easier because you're like, oh, there's a there's a bug in this image. I'll pull it down. I'm not right. I'm not trying to pull down a change set and then make sure my environment matches right. Right, but of course, if if you are pulling that image, you actually need to know what code was actually running in it as well. And I think that's that's an important next point here, which is that you need to carry that history with you. Yeah. So uh, you know, a lot of us think about the latest tag. You should probably forget that if you're deploying a thousand times a day. Latest is just a random image. It's like you don't even know what, what's in latest, right? right. So um, that means you can't really rely on that as, as your strategy. Instead, you need to have those things living on their image and be aware of it. And you'll see what I mean here in a little bit. Um, one of the things you should be able to support is what I call time travel. Uh, what is time travel? Well, time travel is the ability to say, I need to go back to what was running at 9.15 AM last Monday. Now, of all you people in the city in this room, think. How fast can you answer that question? Because if it's within 30 seconds, then you're in a good spot, right? Um, so you want to be able to support time travel. And I'll show you what that looks like uh, in a few minutes. Um, you also want to have it closely coupled with Git. So if you're looking at an image, you should be able to find out the diff, that's a, the code changes that went into that image very quickly, right? So if something's broken, you need to debug it. You've got an image. What do you know about it? An image should not be a black box. Right, and I think the classic use case, right, is that you're working on a bug, you're trying to fix something, and you have a patch. And the patch m maybe fixed it or maybe didn't. And you have a report that the, the issue is still occurring. So one of the most important things, of course, is that you need to know, did the patch actually reach production? Or are you getting these bug reports on the unpatched version? If you don't know what code is actually running that image, it's really hard to answer that question. Yeah. And so as long as your image is like, tied to the git commit, you can go back, look at the history, see whether or not that patch made it, and then decide, OK, well, the patch actually didn't work. Or maybe it just wasn't deployed. And I think that's, that's an important distinction. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and if the reason you're, why you if you're driven by Git, then you're going to also be using automated builds, right? Right. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point because 
we're just saying that you need to know what's actually running in production. If you're building those images locally, it, it's possible that you may have uncommitted changes in them, which of course blows up that, that traceability. Uh, so as long as you're using an automated build server, th then you can feel confident that it's actually reflecting everything that's currently in Git. Um, and if, you, if you're not doing that, then it makes the previous point a lot harder. Yeah, I would, I would actually enforce that from like a, even a security right. <laughs> process. Well, yeah, because it's anyway. not getting code reviewed either, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it basically just bypasses the process, so you can't do that. Um, so that's kind of what it is to center on images. Uh, the second thing that we've learned from high-velocity teams is that high-velocity teams shift left. Uh, so what does it mean to shift left? Um, I'll give you a quote here, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it. Uh, this quote's from Damon Zirkler. He says, when our engineers commit code, CodeFresh, and, and you, could, you could build this yourself as well, CodeFresh runs all the testing we need and spins up an environment just for the feature they worked on. Our QA and design teams can access this unique environment and do a level of testing that just wasn't possible before. Our test cycle went from three days to three hours. So this is, hopefully you get the idea of this is a big benefit to shift left. What does it mean to shift left? Well, you're all probably familiar with this diagram. This is a, a typical uh, dev release process. You make a feature branch, you make a commit, and every commit you run unit tests. And then when you're ready, you issue a pull request. Uh, someone reviews the code, and then you push it into staging where you do your deeper, deeper level of testing, integration, performance, uh, security testing, licensing, scanning, all those kinds of things. Now, typically, you can only do that once you reach staging, because that's the only place where your application can access all of its associated services, its backend, uh, the, basically the full application stack. The result of this is that your staging step becomes a huge bottleneck, and it becomes a cost sink. Uh, so if you think about it, what's the most expensive part of that process that we just looked at? It's code review. Code review is very expensive because your time is the most expensive time. Paying for a few extra, uh, few extra cycles on compute. Uh, yeah, yeah, on compute, it's not a big deal. Um, so what we can do is actually we can eliminate this uh, and we can fix it by shifting left. So this is what a shifted left pipeline looks like. Every time you make a commit, instead of only running unit tests, you should be able to app. Uh, you can you should be able to access the service you're changing, along with all of its dependent services, to run not just unit tests, but also integration tests, performance tests, security tests, uh, even user acceptance testing, before you do the pull request. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if you're a developer and you're working, you're going to get instant feedback on everything about the change that you've made, not just if it passed unit tests. You're going to know everything. And so you can, you can make all the changes. So when you do issue a pull request, not only is it going to be higher quality, but the person doing that pull request, they already know that it works, right? They already know that it works. We've already seen that it works. It already, it already went up in an environment. It's already been validated. Um, they have all the proof points they need. And then when they're doing that pull request, all that they're looking for really is like, let's make sure that we have style here. Let's make sure that you know, we're following you know, best practices, security, those kinds of things. So that's what it really means to shift left. It basically means to take all of those testing, your full stack testing, and moving it so that it happens on the commit at the branch level, um, for basically for every branch that you, you work on. The third thing that we have seen from these teams, and uh, actually I think William, you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, is, well, to basically achieve what you're saying, you, you need to have a portable application. Mm -hmm. So that feature branch is effectively bring up an ephemeral environment, right? Yep. So it kind of looks like your staging environment, but instead of just having the one, you have like as many as you have features. Yeah, you have nth staging environments. Right, so that's really hard to do if your application isn't defined well. So you need to make sure that you have like very clear definition of your environment. And a good way to test this is to look at your mean time to recovery. So having a, a low mean time to recovery is generally a good thing anyway, mm -hmm. right? But it's also a good metric to see like, um, yeah, like how quick can you actually bring this environment up? How quickly can you create that ephemeral branch? If you, if you can't do that, it probably means that you're, you're not doing this very well. Um, so something at Google that we do is this disaster recovery test, and we kind of do it like, I think about twice a year. And we'll use an example like this, you know, the meteor like hit a data mm. center or, or some kind of crazy example, or aliens have invaded or something, just, just to sort of set the scene. Um, but it's, imp but it's important to do that disaster recovery. And, and when you do that, does it always go well, always smoothly? Well, not always, but that's kind of the point, that's right? That's the point, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so if you don't have a plan to do that, you definitely should have that plan just from a disaster recovery point. And so I think, uh, so CodeFresh, you have an opinion about this uh, with Helm, right? Yeah, so we've actually, uh, CodeFresh, we've fully embraced Helm charts to do this job for us. If you're not familiar with Helm charts, 
Uh, basically, it allows you to, to define your full application stack with all of the associated services, which images are running, which versions they are, how the networking works. Um, and so uh, with a Helm chart, not only can we, you know, if, if, if CodeFresh was uh, destroyed in some sort of disaster, um, we could redeploy it within, within two minutes. Uh, but it also makes it so that if we want to spin up an ephemeral version of CodeFresh for testing, right. We can do that because we have it well defined. So you're going to get both benefits for the same amount of work. Exactly, both benefits. And uh, we've actually, uh, this is just kind of a side note, but CodeFresh this week we launched um, public support for Helm, ch Helm charts. We've been dogfooding this aggressively internally for about the last six months with some of our customers. And uh, we've found that it's been really, really effective. It's also the most highly requested feature of support for Helm charts. So we announced, announced that right here at KubeCon. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Johnny Ive moment. Yes. And so that's actually Helm, Helm Charts even for like a bespoke application, right? Like a lot mm. of people have used Helm Charts for maybe, you know, if they're releasing software like WordPress that you expect thousands of people to run, but you're also saying that people are actually using that just to represent the full state of their application. Yeah, represent the full state. And it, it solves so many problems, not only from an automated testing standpoint, but also like, hey, how do I get a new, I've got a new engineer on the team. How do I get their environment up and running? Right. Uh, in a lot of companies, that can be like a four-day process. And it's oh, a uh, like a 20-page document, yeah. Yeah, or a 20-page <laughs> document. Um, so this makes it really, really easy to do. Uh, now, um, going into that, uh, a lot of configuration um, right. should live outside of your images, right? Yeah, so we've talked a lot about having these like ephemeral instances or multiple different environments. We also talked about the benefits of being able to take an image that's running in production and actually pull that down locally, connect it to a staging server and, and, and debug it. Of course, that doesn't work if you've baked configuration in images. Like, I really can't make this point enough, I think. Um, the, the test here is that you need to be able to run that same image in test and production. If you can't do that, it generally indicates that you have some, something baked in. So obviously, like, config maps and secrets in Kubernetes are the way to do that. Um, but yeah, make, make sure that you're sort of passing that test, right? Can you take that image and just connect it to any random environment? Um, if, if you can, then you're in a good place, I think, for, for a high-velocity environment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it guarantees you can use the same image. Right. Yeah. So uh, the fourth thing that we've saw, and we just, so we talked about application portability. Um, number four, we found that really high-velocity teams outsource cluster management. Right, and what do we mean by this? So I'm not saying that everyone should just jump onto cloud, uh, although that would be fine if you did. But we're <laughs> saying, like, you're... Application developers should be focusing on building the application, right? So Kubernetes is fantastic in the sense that you can, you can run it in multiple environments. You can run it on-prem, you can run it cloud, you can run it multiple clouds, and a whole combination of all of the above, right? But I think the, the point we're trying to make here is that you, you probably should have a dedicated team focused on actually providing that service to your organization. It shouldn't be the app developers that are like manually in, you know, creating nodes and adding like using QA, ADM mm -hmm. and things like that. You want to have like either, either a central team managing that or you want to be using a, a, a cloud-hosted offering. Yeah, and think of it like how many of you, and raise your hand, how many of you are managing uh, the server racks and replacing broken machines? Okay, uh, Three of you that are on the ops team, you probably should be, right? Nobody else is, right? Um, Kubernetes management is the same story. Uh, if, you're, if you're getting lost in that rabbit hole of maintaining Kubernetes, like you're not going to be effective as a team. You need to have it outsourced either outsourced within your own company or right. outsourced to a cloud provider, right? And of course, like when, when you're choosing where to, where to do this, always consider scalability and redundancy as well. So even if you're doing a fairly small application, you're not sure how success, successful it's going to be, Like probably one of the reasons you picked Kubernetes, as well as the high velocity attributes, is the fact that you actually can scale it if you're successful. So make sure you're positioning yourself for that success by choosing a, a solution that can actually scale when you need it to. And so that brings us to... Um, Open standards, and, and I think one of the benefits of Kubernetes is that it is open, that you can connect up multiple different clouds. You might have seen um, at the keynote this morning, I think Dan announced there's like 40 different vendors now that, that are certified on Kubernetes. So you can actually look for this logo, certified Kubernetes, and, and you have a reasonable degree of confidence that your workload is portable. Uh, but it's definitely something to keep in mind because you lose that open benefit if you're sort of choosing locked-in solutions. Yeah. Uh, and just to emphasize the point, like these are all the different companies that are, that are already in the conformance program. And I made this slide two weeks ago, and I think it's increased by 30% since then. Uh, so you're definitely not spoilt for choice uh, if you want to retain that um, yeah. compatibility, right? Yeah. That's great. So uh, now this is number five is high-velocity teams have to connect all the dots. All the stuff we've talked about 
if kind of backing up to a high level, really what it boils down to is empowering application developers to make changes, right? And if people can access these clusters, they can spin up the environments, you have portability, you're making changes left and right, maybe you have dozens of changes uh, going out every day or, or thousands. Um, if you don't connect all the dots, that's going to look like chaos. Uh, and so if you want to, you need to have this all managed in a place where you can, you can, you can have everything visible. Uh, I'm going to show you how we do it. Um, but you, you, you really need to have that order available to you in order to make all those things happen. So um, I'll show you how we do it at, at CodeFresh. And uh, you can, uh, these, things are, these things are equally applicable outside. So uh, I think everybody can see this OK. Hopefully it's not too small. Uh, do I need to zoom in? Everybody sees OK? Mild indifference? OK. Uh, so this is a view of, I'm sitting inside of CodeFresh. And right now, I'm looking at what's running on my Kubernetes cluster. And you can see I have a bunch of different services here. Uh, luckily, they're all green. Green means good. Red means, oh, no. Yellow is maybe. Uh, you know, So um, they're all green. I can see uh, for all my different namespaces, everything is in the green right now. Um, and if I wanted to understand uh, you know, what's running in production, well, first of all, this I can jump over to my application where the endpoint is sitting. I can see that it's up and running. That's good. Um, but I can also see what image is actually running with each service. So I can, uh, I can click on this and see immediately what image is running. And not only that, but I can see everything that's happened, the entire history. So here you can see um, all the different changes in the timeline, uh, who's contributed to it, I can see that it has unit test coverage. I can see the performance latency. I can see there's the JIRA ticket that's associated with it. So I can jump straight in to see what changes were being made. Um, I also can load up a performance, reports, re performance report. Here I'm using BlazeMeter. And I have a, a quality check that I've added here. Um, now I have also the commit SHA. So if I jump over to the commit SHA, so let's say I'm running this in production. I want to know what was changed. I can actually jump straight to the commit inside of GitHub. So this gives you a chance to see exactly what changed. I can, I can uh, let's say that I'm trying to figure out, maybe I pushed right. a security change. And you want to know if that change is actually in the current image. Right. So I could, I could jump over here, and I could look at the commit history associated with it so I could see those changes. Uh, I don't think any of us have ever experienced the process of having a security change and then having it be overwritten by a change like a day later. No one in this room is familiar with that. There's nothing in the news about that. Uh, should, shouldn't stand out to you at all. Um, but but this, this really makes it powerful, right? If you're trying to understand a change, you're trying to see what went wrong, uh, you're trying to fix something, you're going to have all that information right here at your fingertips, and it's available within 30 seconds. And it's a pretty common use case, right? Because you, you maybe don't know if that fix actually fixed it, but first, you need to know if the fix was actually there, right? Yeah. Because, because it means something completely different, wh whether or not the fix just didn't work or, or it actually wasn't there at all. And I think that's why it's so important to be able to connect that image all the way through to the, um, to the, sh the source code there. Absolutely. I can also see, you know, I can access all the, all the logs that were associated with this. So I can see uh, all the steps that happened, um, how long they took. I can you know, do, my, do, do some digging there. I can also see all the layers associated with that image. So, Having this available, uh, super powerful, um, kind of a superpower that you can have. Now, uh, if I wanted to um, commit a change, uh, and what we'll do actually, um, I debated whether or not we're going to do this because it, it takes a few minutes, but we'll kick it off and, and see if it finishes by the end. Uh, I've got uh, my builds view here. Um, so let's make a change to this really quick. It's always fun to do changes, right? <laughs> Live demos never go wrong. Uh, we're going to say, let's change this so it says, let's chat, um, let's chat KubeCon. Hurrah. We'll save that. Uh, let's commit it. Oh, you have to hit git before that. Everybody can see this OK? Ask me about my terminal later. Total nerd about it. Is that nano that you're using there? Yeah. All right. So, so you're, not, you're not making a comment of nano versus. I'm all right, <laughs> Emacs bro. Um, you win. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and push this. This is going to kick off uh, my commit in that pipeline that we kind of just saw. Now, um, we'll see within, I don't know, 10 seconds that the, this build will kick off. 
There it is. Say hi to KubeCon. Hi, KubeCon. So that's the early best practice, right, of not building locally. Yeah, not building locally. Uh, what this is going to do is it's going gonna, it's gonna to create a one-off environment in which all the build is going to happen. If you saw our talk yesterday on um, building scalable architecture, you actually got a little bit of detail about how this is all, how the back end of the, all this works. Um, it's going to clone all the code. It's going to build the image. You can see we've actually cached all the layers that were associated with the image, so it's only making changes where changes are needed. So that means my build time is going to be roughly 24 seconds, 23 seconds. Now, uh, when it runs these unit tests, it's actually going to spin up a whole, a whole, the whole application stack, and then it's going to associate those with performance tests. Now, performance tests are going to take um, about four minutes, so uh, we'll just stand here awkwardly for the next four minutes and wait for it to happen. Um, no, just kidding, we'll move on, uh, and we'll come back and check and, and see that it's completed in a bit. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you uh, as we kind of walk around and look at this um, is how rollbacks would work. So uh, I mentioned that we've adopted, um, we've adopted Helm charts uh, pretty aggressively. So uh, I'm going to show you kind of a sneak peek behind the curtain of some CodeFresh infrastructure here um, live, on, live on the stage. If I jump over to Kubernetes, uh, I can see all of the clusters I have associated. Now, um, luckily, this, was, uh, this one that's yellow, that's OK. Uh, that one's like in development. Um, all my production stuff is green, so hats so, off. So this is the actual the CodeFresh project This is the actual project CodeFresh itself. project. So right. yeah, we're not going to touch stuff too much. Um, <laughs> You can see staging where there's some stuff going on over there. That's exciting. Uh, but if I jump over to releases, you can actually see um, that I have my production here. I can see that it's been de deployed. And I can, I can click and open this. And I can actually see every upgrade that's happened, um, each one that was superseded, when it happened, what the version was. And I can jump immediately to one and roll it back. Uh, so this gives us really, really great control over managing releases of our product. And you can see from the, from the timestamps on this, we do it all the time, right? Um, so being able to, to this is our, kind of that time travel thing I was talking about, this gives us that ability immediately. Yeah, we're, we're talking about the history before, and I think this, this is a very important point. Like, whoever's, you know, whoever you choose for your CI CD, you need to make sure they actually have features like this because the Kubernetes deployment object doesn't necessarily um, contain all that history and, and, and the ability to link that back to the actual code that you're running. So I yeah. think that's, that's definitely something that I would look for. Well, and one thing that I'd mention, and we'll, we'll have a few minutes for questions here at the end, um, is that CodeFresh actually, this, the, the ability to release a Helm chart is something that we've baked into a pipeline <laughs> image step, and we've made it a plugin that you can take and, and use in your own projects. So that's available. If you search for CodeFresh plugins, there's a GitHub repository. We have a whole bunch of them. We have tools for deploying to Kubernetes, to ECS. Uh, we have tools for deploying Helm charts. Um, we have stuff for working with Jira. Basically, they're images that take arguments uh, and can, can be put into a pipeline, even with Jenkins or, or other tooling that you might use. So that's free for everybody. Uh, enjoy that. Use it. Uh, contribute. We'd love to see that program grow. So this gives me my view of all my Helm chart stuff, which is awesome, I can, and I can manage that whole process. Um, let's jump back and look and see. I don't think it's been five minutes, so it probably won't be completed yet. But we can jump back anyway and see just where it's at with that build. And so what's the, what's the benefit of running the performance tests? Well, yeah, so that, actually, this is a really good question. Because if you're, your performance tests, uh, when you're, if you, even if you launch your whole stack, it's, you're not necessarily going to have like a million nodes dedicated to each of these. The benefit of this in, is basically that you can track performance changes over time in sort of the small scale environment. So this is a, this is a smaller environment than what's going to run in production. But you can actually watch the delta of, of latency happen. And then this gives you the ability to see spikes and to see trends. And so over time, you can track how your changes are affecting performance and which changes had the biggest impact on performance. So that's actually a really valuable feature. Now, when this finishes, and it's going to be another minute and a half, so we'll probably take some questions in the meantime. Um, when this finishes, what it's going to do is uh, it'll finish annotating the JIRA ticket. It'll finish um, adding all this information to this, the image. And then we'll actually do a rolling update uh, of, uh, into, into, the, into Kubernetes. So all of this stuff, um, why do we do all this stuff? Why do we talk about high velocity? Uh, why do we have all these principles? Well, really, for us, we want you to be successful. As engineers, we're, we're successful as CodeFresh, as Google Cloud. We're successful when you're successful, when you're able to deploy a lot, 
when you're able to be really effective, that's when we win. So that's what we want to contribute uh, to everybody today is uh, these principles that lead to high velocity. Um, to help you do that, uh, I really recommend Google Cloud Platform as the best place to create and manage clusters. I think that they're probably two years ahead of everybody else in terms of features and manageability, portability. Uh, just an incredible platform, really cost effective, dedicated fiber. Talk to me about load balancers later if you're into load balancers. I know a lot of you are. Ch chat with me about load balancers. Um, but that's why we really love Google Cloud Platform, and it's why we chose it for our back end, and we recommend it uh, to all of our customers. And of course, Codefresh is an excellent way to run your CIC pipelines. Uh, particularly, I think you did the, the deployment really well. A lot, a lot of CI systems I see like kind of like skip the deployment bit, or it's like the last bit. Right. Um, yeah, so I mean, we, we hope that all these principles are kind of broadly pl applicable, whoever you use. Uh, of course, you know, this is us, so we're a little bit biased. But, <laughs> but we hope it's useful and, and broadly applicable to, to any kind of environment uh, that you're running Kubernetes and, and CICD on. Yeah, now to, to help you try everything we've talked about, you can actually try all this stuff for free. Um, stop by our booths for details. We actually have some special KubeCon codes uh, that we're giving away at our booths. So stop by and chat with us. We'll give you those codes. both. Uh, good for Google Cloud platform credits and for CodeFresh credits. So stop by our booths. Um, we're just downstairs. And then uh, we can look back. We can see that this uh, deployment uh, step didn't quite finish. So we'll, we'll skip out on that. Right. Um, any questions? Question. Um, what do the health charts represent for you in that scenario? Um, because it would seem that it's a one-to-one -one relationship between my monolithic app and deploying the whole environment. But in reality, this whole thing would be hundreds of microservices. Yeah. So what is the relationship between the charts? Who owns those charts? Or when you build them, what gets deployed into the, into the environment? Yeah, so when, you, if, when you're deploying a Helm chart, when you're deploying a Helm chart update, it doesn't have to redeploy images that are already existing. It can, uh, you can decide. Basically, Helm charts lets you specify and say, I want you to always pull the images. Or you can say, I only want you to update the ones that have changed. Um, so it's really up to you to decide which one you want to go with. Uh, in the demo that I just did where I deployed, I was actually deploying a single service. And so I wasn't redeploying the whole stack. Um, but it, it's a very very similar looking uh, process. Cool, question? What, what happens in the event that uh, image that the code run? So the question is, uh, what happens if the image is bad or if the code doesn't run? Yeah, so if the image is bad, um, you can basically build into your pipeline a flag that says, uh, A, I don't want you to continue, right? So don't go put this somewhere. Stop where you're at. Um, B, send me a notification in Slack. C, uh, make a note on the JIRA ticket, you know, all those kinds of things. Oh, so it, uh, yeah, your question is, what happens if it goes to my Kubernetes cluster and Kubernetes, for some reason, can't pull the image? So maybe I didn't set up my image secret correctly or something like that. Right. Yeah, it's crashing. So, so definitely, uh, you want the, like, the liveliness and the readiness probes in Kubernetes. Um, uh, in particular, the, the readiness, uh, sorry, the liveliness probe um, will actually detect that crash state. And then if you're doing a rolling update, what it'll do is it'll, like, it'll, it'll replace like one of them it'll see it a crash, and it'll basically pause the update at that point. So you, so you won't kind of get left in that bad state. Yeah, yeah so I highly, highly recommend um, readiness and liveliness. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, and you can also use like canary deployments to answer that question, um, yeah. which is both, both things that you can do with CodeFresh and Google Cloud. Yes, uh, CodeFresh is cloud agnostic. Yep. Um, obviously, I, I, I'm biased towards Google Cloud, but you can use it with any conformant Kubernetes cluster. So if it's DigitalOcean, if it's AWS, if it's IBM Bluemix, uh, if it's the one sitting on that dude's watches yesterday, I don't know how conformant that was, but you, if it's Kubernetes, uh, we can connect to it. Yeah, and that's the benefit of Kubernetes, right? Like, like when we're pitching the integration of Kubernetes itself yeah. to you, it's like, well, you can do this for Google, but also you're getting everybody else that supports Kubernetes along for free. You know. Yeah, you can deploy to both at the same time. I can show you uh, if I look over at. That's a really good point. Like, I, I think I think a lot of people are actually doing multi-cloud, right? As as a redundancy. It's so important. Yeah. Yeah. Don't apologize. That's. Yeah. Yeah. If uh, we're, we're, I can we're show all you about a... hybrid and multi-cloud, and I mean that's that's the great thing about Kubernetes, right? You can have that one control plane, that that one kind of way to deploy your images, and just put it wherever you wherever you want to run it. Yeah. 
so you can see, like, right now in this account, I have an IBM Bluemix cluster set up. I have two clusters on Google Cloud Platform. I could add them for AWS or just any custom cluster. I can add a custom cluster. And then you can deploy to as many clusters as you want. Or you could do multi-cloud cluster. You know, that's right. a whole other scenario. But yeah, definitely. What kind of image metadata are we using so we can see do rollbacks? And the change history. Yeah, so uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. Basically, each step um, will record what happened, and then uh, CodeFresh has a built-in registry where you can annotate the information associated with it. We actually use a standard called um, Open Griefus, Open. Open gra grass. There's a booth for it downstairs. We just announced it, our support for it this week. Um, so you can Google. Uh, if you look on our blog, it'll be like the second post back over what we blogged this morning. But basically, there's a standard for annotating images that um, it's very new. It's backed by uh, I think Google Cloud, I think JFrog, and CodeFresh are sort of leading the way on that. Um, but yeah. Question was, how do you de um, deploy a rollback configuration with secrets? Yeah, so um, actually, I have a talk on this tomorrow. Um, yeah, so what one option is is using Git, uh, obviously for the configuration, not the secrets. Uh, and I don't want to kind of spoil the talk, but um, there, there's a there's a cool project. I forget the name of it actually, but you can actually set up like a private and a public key, and you can share the public key uh, to every to all your developers, and the private key remains in the cluster. So you have like a single secret in the cluster, and then you then you can actually encrypt all of the secrets. And just put them in Git, right? Because no one can actually decrypt them unless you have the private key. So, mm -hmm. uh, so it basically boils down to use Git for everything. Of course, you don't want to put raw secrets in Git, so then you want to encrypt them. Um, but to avoid having kind of like, you know, we, we talked about mean time to recovery and and bring up a new environment. It's kind of a pain if you have like you know 50 secrets you have to provision. Yeah. So like th then what you can do is provision that one secret, which sort of bootstraps all the rest. Um, uh, we actually also provide, uh, inside of CodeFresh, you can um, export secrets and move them into another pipeline. Uh, so if you if you're, want to set up like a new environment, it's actually really easy to like duplicate the pipeline, right. set a new target, and then make your change and then test it. Would you rebuild an image every time when you want to change? No, you don't need to rebuild the image. Um, you can basically have a configuration-specific pipeline. And then you can have one pipe. You can have your build pipeline kick off the, you know, configuration pipeline, or you can just run them separately. It's it's kind of, you know, up to you. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, search for GitOps tomorrow. That'd be a keyword. Yep. Yeah. GitOps. Go ahead. That's a good question. The question was, you guys are using Helm charts. Um, what are the special advantages of using Helm charts, and what are maybe some disadvantages of using Helm charts? Yeah. Um, you're probably more familiar with the disadvantages. Yeah, I've got a couple. That's where you're the best. <laughs> um, well, you know, one of the things is uh, Helm has its own kind of authorization model. So sometimes, like, if you've really locked down your cluster, you, you sort of have to think about the, the tiller. Um, in Helm, because what you don't want to do is have like a, a brilliantly configured cluster, which is all nice and secure, and then you just open this sort of door into it. I mean, it's okay. Like you just have to you have to be aware of what you're doing and, and kind of um, set that up correctly. So that's kind of a common pitfall. Uh, I would say that Helm charts is by no means perfect. Um, it's under very active development right now. I mean, I, <laughs> this is cool. Renee's like we launched 1.8 a month ago. 1.9 is about to drop. Um, so it's under a lot of active development. I would encourage you to like jump into that, that working group. Uh, but what we've seen is that of all the different standard ways of defining an application for Kubernetes, um, Helm Charts is the most comprehensive, and it's also the easiest to use. Um, it, it has some really nice features with how it handles variables and kind of file construction, configuration construction. So um, in our minds, we kind of we weighed this. Uh, we started looking at this like a year and a half ago. Um, trying to decide like what's the standard going to be because uh, we basically kind of did uh, Docker Compose, Docker Swarm support um, in a similar way, and we said, well, what's it going to be for Kubernetes? And when we really sat down and went through everything, we, we played around with starting our own standard and, and talked to some people about that. Uh, we worked with Bitnami a little bit, and um, basically we all kind of came together. And you know, Bitnami now has launched uh, Helm apps, um, so I think 
most, I think the, the kind of the large players that I see that are really interested in application define, definement, we're kind of settling on Helm charts now. So I think it's going to be the standard, um, always subject to change. But that's, I think that's the future. Yeah, I think it's definitely, sorry, just to add to that, I think it's definitely like a, definitely under active development. So it does look like Helm's winning, but I think there's, there's a lot of different options. So we'll watch that space, I would suggest. Yeah. Um, and, and there are alternatives, right? You can, you can define your application perfectly fine just by having YAMLs for, for everything as well. Um, and if you're doing that, uh, what I recommend is either having a separate namespace or a separate cluster. Uh, so like we just made like cluster management free, I think like most, like, like the trend seems to be like free clusters for yeah. cloud anyway. So you, you know, whether, it's a, whether it's a namespace or whether it's a whole cluster, the benefit there is that you, then you don't have to change the variables, right? Like you can just repeat the whole thing. So yeah. you, you can have like a, a bunch of um, YAML files as well. Um, and maybe with like the configuration YAML that's different for each one. Um, I'd, I'd some people that, even use Compose still, right? So yeah. that's, you I'd know, say Helm, on, on Helm is are. probably a safe two-year bet uh, at, at a minimum. We'll see what new standards come out, and we'll support those ones when they do. But I think that's the standard for now. And um, you know, as things develop, we'll make changes. But I think that's that's the one that is. If you're interested in that yeah. topic, uh, Brian Grant, he's a, a tech lead on my team. Um, he has a lot of thoughts on the matter. So uh, follow him, I guess. Uh, I think he has a talk at KubeCon. Yeah. Yeah. What was your question? Does, help, uh, does Cofresh help us to, to manage the secrets uh, instead of putting them on um, the help chart? Yeah, so there are two different places that you think about secrets. One is inside of a cluster. So if I, I can actually uh, work with my configuration maps here, so I can create, I can create a config map for a specific namespace inside of Codefresh and manage those. Um, I can uh, encrypt those, and then also secrets associated with images I can do the same thing. So if I'm looking at like, um, you know, pipeline, I can go down to environmental variables, and I can create and encrypt. Uh, you know, I can encrypt those on the fly, um, and then I can store them. You know, make them portable. This, uh, yes. Well, yes. Yeah. Right. The, the ones that yeah for Kubernetes, yes, they'll be the name. The config maps will be in the in the in the cluster. Any other questions? How do your developers uh, work locally when the environment is like, changing so fast? You have other teams over at your services, so now it really gets changed in the help chart that you do. Right? So, like, day one, the developer pulls down the help charts and sets up like global development on Vicky or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, so I think this really, uh, this really encourages um, microservices, because if you have microservices, you can basically have a small team working on one microservice. Um, so there's not like a million changes to a single microservice happening every day. And that's actually where you are more likely to run into problems. Your services should maintain interoperability, right? Like that's the whole point of doing. So you're saying they don't have to like constantly be up to date. They can actually lag a little bit. Yeah, they should right. be able to lag a little bit. And it shouldn't be a huge problem. but again, before it deploys, it's actually going to rerun it with whatever is currently the thing and then deploy it. So you'll always get that smoke test, um, and you'll always be testing against whatever latest is. Uh, so even if you're, and then if you run into issues, you can pull down and, and figure out what went wrong. So it, it puts you in a good position to make and those changes. I think one of my, one of my favorite features actually of CodeFresh is, is the ephemeral um, feature branch environments. So like, while, while Minikube is great, you, know, you can also just use that um, as like your own little environment. Um, yeah, Minikube, Minikube is nice, but it, it does a lot of things that are, um, I would say it doesn't pass these c c Kubernetes <laughs> conformance spec. Well, uh, well, actually, it isn't certified. Probably, probably should be, but yeah, it's not. no one certified it yet. It, it, I don't know if it does or not, but no, it has no some, one bothered to It has to some run. limitations that, yeah, I think, um, yeah. Well, the other thing is, like, depending on how many microservices you have, performance can be a problem, too. Mm -hmm. um, so the nice thing about your ephemeral environments is that it has all the resources it needs. Um, yep, you scale up for what you need. I had this funny experience. I was at a, a very large company. I won't name their name. I won't name them, but uh, I was we we're getting together for lunch. I was walking through the engineering floor, and there was this engineer that had two computers on his desk. And I was like, "Why does this dude got two computers? Is he that good? He can just do both hands at once?" And they're like, "No, no. He makes a change. He commits. It builds, and then he goes to the other computer." <laughs> I was like, "Oh my gosh! This is a big company. This is a company you all know." So uh, it was it was really shocking. But um, not, not my company. Not, not your company. But, no. but I wouldn't say our bills are actually like super fast either. <laughs> uh, cool. Question? <clears throat> Yeah, of course. 
So uh, we have a customer named Steelcase. Um, Damon Zirkler was the guy I quoted in this presentation. What they actually do is they use live data. Uh, when they do their tests, they actually basically pull down live data and load it into images that they put as part of their test pipeline. Um, so that, that's, it's kind of an interesting idea because you think of it as a database as being a stateful thing. Uh, depending on the changes, what you're testing, you could connect the thing you're testing to the real database. If really you're just worried about reading or something. Yeah, yeah, but, but, things that have side but you could also take that and bake it into an image that is, uh, in essence, stateless. Um, you're going to make changes to it, but you don't really care if it dies uh, unless that, that flags a problem for you. So you don't necessarily care when you're testing it if that data is going to be around forever. So having a persistent data layer is maybe not as important. So a lot of times we'll see people bake them into images and then use those as part of their sort of test infrastructure part. Sorry, I think that's quite not what the question was. Basically, you have parts that are part of the Kubernetes cluster. Like I see. Database right. So, on. so we are working on this. There's a, there's a new effort called Service Catalog, uh, which is meant to solve that. So Service Catalog. Uh, allows you to specify a, like a SaaS resource. Assume, uh, hey, I just want like a MySQL database, or like I just want a pub something or something. Um, yeah. It's not quite ready yet. It's it's still in development, but but that's the goal there. When, when uh, so you, I think for, yeah. I think for now the solution would be you would have to actually have a representation of that that you could deploy in the cluster. But we definitely want to solve that problem. Yeah, you basically have two options. One, if it's like MySQL, then you're like, okay, I can create an image with MySQL data in it and use that. If it's like an RDS or something, you're basically like, well, I want to duplicate the RDS uh, and have it sitting and available for lots of different test things to hit. Um, and depending on what you're, what you're testing, you may, be not, you may be okay with it being a shared resource. Right, but I mean, I, I definitely get the point where you, you might want it to be the actual. Yeah, you know, totally, 100%. Um, yeah. But that's so always so, going to be so an so issue like, like Salesforce. Like you have to test against the Salesforce API. Well, you're not ever going to get a Salesforce image. Like it's not going to happen, right? Um, so you have to, you kind of have to work with these like sandbox environments that you duplicate at external to. But yeah, service catalog would be the one to watch for that. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Uh, the slides. Uh, you can upload them on the schedule. Yes, uh, they're gonna, they're uploaded. They're gonna be uploaded onto the schedule thing, and then if you watch Code Fresh on Twitter, I'll also tweet them out. Great. So one of the goals for my team is to create a Kubernetes cluster. Mm -hmm. But have different development teams create these images and give it to us, and be hosted on the Kubernetes cluster. Right. But when there are so many zillion uh, teams creating these images, how do you ensure that your cluster is big enough to kind of run all these different images? Yeah. So, do you are you running the cluster in your own infrastructure, or is it no, cloud infrastructure? So uh, node scaling is something right. that Google Cloud does. So, really, really if, well. if it was GKE, the, you would look at the cluster autoscaler. So there are, there, are, there are two types of auto-scaling in Kubernetes. Uh, there's like the pod auto-scaling, which is scaling up the deployment based on demand. But then there's the cluster auto-scaling. So that, that takes care of the, your problem, oh. which is like someone just scheduled a whole bunch of containers and there aren't enough nodes. The cluster auto-scaler says, hey, it looks like you need a bunch of extra nodes, and it will provision them within kind of like about 45 seconds. Yeah. Um, Google Cloud and and vice versa, by the way. It, it can actually scale it back down. You know, um, Google Cloud something. is very good at this. Um, there are also solutions for doing it on Amazon. Uh, but basically, auto scaling is something when you're looking at where you're going to host your Kubernetes. Node scaling is a super critical feature to have if you want to support that scalability. And basically, CodeFresh's infrastructure is entirely elastic, right? So, like, we have 15,000 users, and uh, we don't get the advanced notice of when they're going to be heavily using the platform. Um, so, we basically have node scaling enabled. And so, when, uh, when Kubernetes isn't able to, to schedule a new pod, um, GKE says, hey, I noticed that you have this pod won't schedule because there's not enough resources. Let me add some nodes for you. Boom, everything happens. And then when, it's, when, it, uh, when the, the, the high times have died down, um, it's smart enough to say, it looks like you're not using these nodes. We'll pull these down so you're not paying for them. This is actually a thing that I love about Kubernetes because I think, I think you can actually save a lot of money doing that too. Like in the past, you'd have to like provision to your high watermark, right? right. And the great thing about cloud in general and, and Kubernetes yeah. is that you, know, you, you can just pay for what you're using. Google Cloud actually has per second pricing uh, and has, well, has had it for like two years. I think Amazon just added it. We have per minute and then we per have min, per Oh, second. per minute pricing, sorry. So, uh, but, yeah. but now we have per second, yeah. yeah. Oh, now it's per second? Yeah, as of like a month or two ago. <laughs> so now you're ahead of Amazon. They're, they're no, they they actually minute. went from per alley to per second. They're going to go to nanosecond, bro. <laughs> Don't even worry. We Don't even. 
Uh, what was your question? So uh, a couple minutes ago, y'all mentioned the, the difference between like Helm charts versus the more declarative YAML approach with Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, can you kind of compare and contrast those? In particular, I'm interested in the in the declarative approach. How do you how do you manage doing kind of a CI pipeline or deployment pipeline when typically you would have to say change the version of the you know of the image and check that in to get right and then have that be part so. So one approach is you can have two repositories, like one for all the config and one for the code. Mm -hmm. That way you're not doing an image rebuild every time you change the config. You can also then um, treat config changes as if they'll code and go through like a full review process. Uh, I've also seen some of our users will actually have the um, have that config defined as a secret, or basically as a uh, as an environmental variable. And so like, then, like the version. Yeah, so that right. they can just change it on the pipeline that they're working on and get what they need. Um, so that's another way, way to approach it. But I'll plug my talk tomorrow again, which is GitOps, uh, which is relevant. And, I, and I'm pretty sure you can apply everything in that to Codefresh, too. Yeah. Last question, and then we're going to have to shut down and go. Yeah, we work with companies that have hundreds of microservices. How do you normalize the kind of pipelines to make it all that everyone can benefit? Every service, every thousand microservices you have can benefit from the same thing. Yeah, you can do a couple of things. Uh, one, you can you can use chained pipelines. So you can actually have a pipeline, and then you can make the next pipeline available to it. So let's say you have a pipeline that's just the performance, all the performance steps. And all that pipeline needs is to have an environment passed to it. So you say, you basically, it's almost like an API, right? You say, this pipeline is available. You can plug into it. It will do all its work, and it will pass back the information wherever you need. You just need to pass in the variables ahead of, uh, it into that pipeline. So you can, use, you can kind of use um, centralized pipelines like that. Um, the other thing that I would mention is that Helm Charts focuses on dependency management as a function of microservices. So when you have a service, you can say, these are the services that this microservice is dependent on. And then you're not taking necessarily even the whole stack. You're only taking the portion of it that you need. This is something that um, Google is actually really good at. Google uses a single Git repo for everything. Well, not Git, but yeah. Oh, sorry. Google uses a single repo for everything. This is, this is Chromebooks, Google Cloud, Gmail, everything. It's all in one giant repo. The way that they do that is they have really good dependency uh, management. So they can, so if I'm working on a change, I can pull down just the stuff I need to work with and not the 47 terabytes that make up all of Google's information, right? Or whatever it is, probably more than that. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, this was yeah. really actually fun to have you guys hang out and chat with us and yeah, ask thanks questions. Thanks for sticking around. Um, if you want to talk more, hang out at our booth. Thanks.